Uh, man, I hate Tennessee because first of all, it's Tennessee, and I I, I just hate them because they 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 low down, they dirty, they some snitches, and I hate Philip Farmer. I hate their colors. I'm not a dog person. I, I just hate Tennessee. Man. Like, you are locked on Kentucky. Your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right, what's going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dahl, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast specifically, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. I want to remind everybody out there that we are free and available on all platforms. Kentucky basketball rolling on the recruiting trail. A lot of you said earlier on in the uh, in the year that Kentucky couldn't get it done. Uh, some of you said you were really frustrated with the direction of the program, specifically in terms of recruiting. A lot of people were frustrated saying Duke may be taking things over, and we were losing a lot of different battles, the Wildcats were, and here we are. Third five-star of this 2023 recruiting class, Justin Edwards has committed to the Wildcats, decided to choose Kentucky over the Tennessee Volunteers. Five-star small forward out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Going to talk about him today. Also going to be talking a little bit of Kentucky football. It's almost that time of the year. I love college football with a passion. Uh, I'm really looking forward to giving y'all some phenomenal football content as we get closer to the season and throughout the 2022 college football season. But to start here, Justin Edwards, again, like I mentioned, six foot eight, 180 pounds. He wanted to announce his commitment following Peach Jam early on in his recruitment. From what I can tell, it looked like he was a strong Tennessee lean. The Wildcats stayed with him. They stuck with, uh, with him through the process and slowly kind of worked him back to the Wildcats. Averaged 15.3 points per game during his time uh, at Peach Jam. The thing that I want to talk about here before we get into the positives, I want to speak on the potential negatives because I've looked at some scouting reports on this kid. The scouting report on this kid is that he is, in essence, an overall type of player. You go and watch his play. You go watch what he did at Peach Jam, though, and a lot of people will note that whenever he is forced to offensively produce a, at a significant volume, he's not the most efficient shooter. He shot 43% from the field during his time at Peach Jam, seven rebounds, three steals a game to go along with those numbers. So uh, that's kind of what I wanted to address here quickly at the top is there were some people out there that point out, you know, he's he, whenever he, you force him to shoot the basketball a ton, he's not the most efficient scorer. I don't think Kentucky's going to ask him to be a volume type of guy, and there are a lot of different possessions where Pe- at Peach Jam where he was kind of forced to do things that I don't necessarily think he's going to be asked to do. But the positive that I want to focus on here He is an all-around type of guy. A lot of scouting reports will tell you that. You go and watch his film. Uh, It's something interesting about his film. Unlike other highlight tapes out there that you see where where you'll see kids just do like the same one or two things over and over and over again. If you look at the highlight tape of a center, it's going to be him dunking and blocking shots. You know, it's it's essentially going to be that. You look at a point guard, it's going to be him, or a shooting guard, excuse me. It's going to be him shooting a lot of different threes, running in transition. That's probably what you're going to see. You're going to see a lot of offense and transition and him shooting threes. It's the things that they're good at that they're trying to highlight. You look at this kid's tape, though, and it's interesting because you see every single thing that the scattering reports say about him. You see the uh, his ability to facilitate. You see his ability to score at all three levels. You see his defensive ability, which we're going to get to in a second. He is truly, according to his tape, his highlight reel, an all-around type of guy. He can do a little bit of everything. But defensively here, I think it's where he truly does shine. He's very, very sound defensively. He's not the most intimidating player physically. Let's get that straight. Six foot eight, 180 pounds. But... I think defense is overall the the stronger element of his game, and that's just in my opinion. Athletically, again, not somebody that's going to impose his will on you consistently, offensively or defensively, but I really, really like his length on the defensive end. His anticipation is something that a lot of people have talked about. I think he's going to be racking up steals with the Wildcats this time next season, Uh, and you you look at his numbers at Peach Peach Jam, three steals per game, is something you got to be really, really excited about. Uh, Zach Gagin, or Gagin, excuse me, with on three, 
uh, noted something interesting about Edwards in this recruiting class, and we're going to touch on this a little bit more in just a second. This is a direct quote from Zach Gagan. With Edwards now in the fold and the five-star or five-star freshman wing Chris Livingston earning praise during the offseason, Calipari is loading up on the archetype player the NBA is craving. Two-way wings who can play three or even four positions. And I wanted to stop here, and I wanted to point out something. Kentucky, it looks like, is trying to modernize and evolutionize the way that they do things from an X's and O's standpoint. We've talked about that a little bit this offseason. It looks like they're trying to become a little bit more... Uh, I, I think there's there's a little bit more spacing, an emphasis on spacing, if you will, on the Kentucky offense. It looks like that, at least from what we've seen and what we've heard. You get a kid like this who is really, really strong and in and, 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 and essentially Kentucky's type of system, I think he's going to thrive. I'm really excited to see what Justin Edwards does in, the, in this system. Again, two-way wings who can play three or even four positions. He He's not got two... He, again... We talk about his size physically. He's not physically imposing. You could play him at the two, potentially, if you needed to. If you had to rotate him onto somebody defensively, you could certainly do that. Uh, And then offensively, I think, you know, you work on his shooting a little bit, and he's somebody that you could potentially put at the two as well. You could put him at the four if you need to. He's six foot seven. You want to play a little small ball. I definitely think you could find yourself in a rotation, maybe not with Cal at the helm, but certainly... If he makes it to the league, I think you could find certainly see him in a, in a, in a rotation where he is playing uh, that small four. But yeah, I'm really excited about this kid. I, I think that he's going to be essentially kind of plug and play, play. And once he potentially makes it to the league, I think he would definitely thrive there. You you talk about the out term or excuse me, the outlook, the long term uh, thought process here. Obviously feels like a one-and-done type of guy, but rounding his outside shot out and solidifying his offensive game outside of what he can do in transition, which you go and look at his film, he's really, really solid in transition. He's a good scorer overall, but I think his transition game is where he truly shines. If he can round out his outside shot, again, solidify his offensive game, uh, and that's something I think that Kentucky can help him with. Developmentally, I think that they can definitely get him to where he needs to be and he'll slot in at the three, I think, comfortably after Livingston departs. I know that that you look at this kid and you look at this prospect and you think, okay, well, what's he going to do potentially for the Wildcats? I think as we see him gain more experience in practice this time next year, and I, and I think we're going to watch him go through the non-conference slate, and I think we're going to see him work on those two specific things, his outside shot and solidifying his overall offensive game. I think you're going to see him grow as a player. He looks like the type of guy that that it would be capable of stepping into a situation at Kentucky where he, he could just take off. A lot of people have pointed out this kid's maturity and his ability to learn. I'm really excited about this prospect. There's a reason that this kid, according to the 24-7 Sports Composite, is the number three overall player in the country. Again, number one small forward in the country, number one player out of the state of Pennsylvania, number three overall player and the 24-7 sports composite. And he's actually the number two overall player in just the raw 24-7 sports ranking. Has a raw 99 uh, flat rating. Really excited about this kid. The super class that Kentucky could be putting together. You know, they've already got, like I mentioned, Rob Dillingham, Reed Shepard, Justin Edwards, DJ Wagner may be on the way. Aaron Bradshaw could potentially still be in the mix. Ron Holland could potentially still be in the mix. This is a class right now that has number one overall potential. I'm really, really excited about what Cal's doing on the recruiting trail, and you have to think, you have to think that he's going to be able to kind of fill in the gaps on the bench this time next year with transfer portal players. And we've talked a lot on, on this show about what you need to do to build your roster in, in a way that could get you through the NCAA tournament. And we've talked about how tough that is to get through the NCAA tournament. I have kind of come to the conclusion, I think a lot of different people have come to the conclusion that it's not necessarily objectively you have to get five-star one-and-done kids or you have to get transfer portal players with a ton of experience. You have to find some type of balance there, right? I think I like the five-star over the transfer portal player. That's just me personally. We've talked about that before on the show. If you feel the need for me to rehash that, I can definitely do that in later episodes. But I like having this five-star talent on the front And I really, really like potentially having some transfer portal experience or some more experienced players on the roster, period, kind of backing these guys up, backing up the Rob Dillinghams and the Justin Edwards of the the class, right? 
I think the rotation that Cal is setting up for the future is sound. It's really, really exciting. I love the direction of, of Kentucky's basketball program right now. Really, really excited about it. Cannot wait to get to basketball season, but football season is just a little bit closer, guys. Going to talk about what I asked Mark Stoops at SEC Media Day. Is going to talk about the receiving core. And to be honest with you, Mark Stoops gave me an interesting response. Did not expect his response on this. Before we do that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at Built Bar. I've been talking about it a ton over the past several months. Built Bar has these new things called Puffs. It's the first ever protein-infused marshmallow. These things are absolutely phenomenal. They are always covered in 100% real chocolate. And on top of that, they are really, really good for you. They are low in calorie. They are high in protein. And they've got all these new flavors. And they actually just recently sent me uh, cookie dough chunk puffs, which are absolutely phenomenal. I've actually, if you're watching on YouTube, I've got one on the set here. And I do not plan on moving it. It is a staple of my household at this point, Built Bar puffs they are absolutely phenomenal and again like i mentioned really 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 good for you cookie dough chunk puffs actually just to get specific here for a second have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them you need to swap out your protein bars with these they are delicious you can go to built.com right now and use promo code locked 15 to get 15 percent off your order again you can use promo code locked 15 for 15 percent off that is over at built.com All right, continuing along here on the Tuesday edition of Locked On Kentucky, Lance Daw here with you. Really appreciate you guys making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. If you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. We're almost to 1,800. Actually, we might be almost to 1,900 subscribers. Goodness gracious, the goal is 2K regardless before basketball season. I think we're going to get there. We might even get there before football season. All right, Mark Stoops. Was at SEC Media Days. I think he handled himself very, very well. Really enjoyed my time at the College Football Hall of Fame. It was a lot of fun. If you did not listen to our interview with the College Football Playoff Executive Director, Bill Hancock, uh, recently on the podcast, you can go, go find that on the podcast feed or on YouTube. Really, really fun conversation with him talking about college, the college football playoff and an expansion, his personal preferences. This is a guy that essentially created the playoff, his personal preferences on what the, the sport needs to do. A lot of fun. Mark Stoops, though, at SEC Media Days, I asked him a question about the receiving core. There are a few spots on this roster that have me concerned, and there are very, very few. Specifically, I look at the receiving core, and I look at the secondary as question marks for me. Again, not not huge major problems. I don't think that they're going to be problems. I just think that it, they're just kind of unknowns. But this is what I asked Mark Stoops. I said, you've got some new faces in the receiver room. Does the youth in the core cause any concern in relation to the passing game and its progression under Will Levis? And I expected Mark Stoops to come out there and say, well, you know, we've got some guys that are young, obviously, but I'm really, really excited about what they're doing. So, no, I don't think it's a concern. I think Will Levis is going to help them. I think the passing game is going to continue to move along. We've got a new OC that is simply essentially implementing our our philosophy that we've had for quite some time now from an X's and O's standpoint. So yeah, I think we're going to be just fine. That was what I expected him to say immediately. He's like, no, it does. It does cause some concern. And I'll directly quote him here. He said, we have some guys that we need to push in the receiver room right now. We've got a lot of youth. He said, we're fortunate. One of the young guys we have came in during the spring. So we had the opportunity to watch him. He was talking about Dane key. He said that Dane Key's a special young man, definitely an impact player. You could see right away he has the mindset that he could pick things up. And then he said Tavion Robinson uh, from Virginia Tech had a lot of experience. We needed that, uh, Mark Stoops noted. He said, we feel like we have a lot of young guys, guys like Christian Lewis that were out there last year. Demarcus Harris has been waiting for his role. And then he said something that I thought was interesting. It might have been coach speak. We feel as a group we're probably as talented as we have been in a long time. There's definitely some youth there that we, we've, we've got a lot of work to do. So, yes, it is a concern. I did not expect him to say, yeah, no, we've got guys that we need to push. We need to get we, we need to get things in order in that room. I expected him to come out there and just kind of cover the guys up and say, no, Levis is going to be just fine. The passing game's just going to be going to be just fine. But you look at one specific guy here, Tavion Robinson from Virginia Tech. If he had not transferred in, this would be one of those things where I come into the season like, okay, this is a problem. You try and band-aid all these different spots in the transfer portal, right? You got some guys on the offensive line. You got some guys on the D-line. You got two or three guys in the secondary, actually, to kind of patchwork things depth-wise. 
But Tavion Robinson is going to be a starter for this team. He may lead the team in reception and receptions and yards. It already kind of feels like that. And I think the question for, for us here, and the question I think for Mark Stoops and his staff as well, who's going to be that secondary guy? Who's going to be that guy that really complements Tavion Robinson? Because if you're expecting Will Levis in the passing game to get better, if you're expecting Rich Gangarello to step in and just kind of smoothly transition things, who's going to be that second guy that steps up? Who's going to be that guy that you develop? We've heard a lot of Barry and Brown uh, in some circles about how excited pe- people are with him. Obviously, Coach Stoops mentioned Dane Key, somebody that was able to come in during the spring. Chris Lewis, another guy. It's a shame Javon Baker did not work out for this team. That would have been another really, really nice piece, a depth piece, a rotational piece uh, in this core. But yeah, I'm curious to see who that guy is. Mark Stoops mentions Key by name. I just don't know if it's going to be him. We'll just have to wait and see. But yeah, the receiving core, I thought it was interesting that Mark Stoops came in there and was just like, yeah, it is a concern. It it could be a problem. Do we expect it to be a problem? No. I I think the offense is going to be just fine. You look at the guys that you have in the running back room, really excited about D Beckwith coming in from Tennessee. Chris Rodriguez, don't know if he's going to serve a suspension or not. We're just going to have to see what happens there. But yeah, I think there's tons of depth in other places in the offensive line. I think it's going to be just fine. This team is going to, going to be able to, to do what they did last year, which is run the ball effectively. And I think Will Levis is going to continue to develop as a quarterback. And I think there's going to be a, there's going to be a, a pretty decent amount of NFL hype around this kid. I know that there's a lot of expectation. And if he falls short of the first round projection that he's been given, people are going to say he's overrated. I, I think that he's going to be just fine, regardless of whether or not he produces statistically like some people expect him to. All right. I want to talk about my SEC Media Days ballot. I want to talk about Kentucky and where I picked them. I'm going to explain why I picked Kentucky to win the SEC East. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Before I do that, though, guys, I want to remind you, if you're listening on podcast and you've not left a five-star review for the podcast, please go ahead and do so. We've got a lot of really fun things coming up on the show. We're going to continue to talk a lot about Kentucky basketball recruiting. Uh, I know that this class is going to be uh, something that is heavily focused on by a lot of different folks, and as it should be, could potentially be getting five five stars. That's a possibility. That is a world that we could potentially be living in. It's a lot of fun. So make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. As of today, we are 33 days away from the college football season. We respect Week Zero here. We, uh, we appreciate Week Zero, and we are going to thoroughly enjoy the Week Zero slate. We are Week Zero truthers here at the Locked On Kentucky Podcast. But yeah, 33 days away, technically, from the start of college football. Make sure you are subscribed to the podcast as well so that you do not miss a single thing. All right, wrapping up the Tuesday edition of Locked On Kentucky. Lance Dahl hanging out with you. I picked Kentucky football to win the SEC East. Yep, I did it. Now, the problem here is... I should have not. I should keep my mouth shut. That's an issue I have. I should not run my mouth because I said the day that the ballots were put out, jokingly, to just about everybody that I could talk to about the ballots, it would be, you know, I, I was running around. I was saying, you know, it'd be really funny is if somebody picked Vanderbilt to win the SEC after Clark Lee, the Vanderbilt head football coach, got up there and said, I think we're going to be one of the best programs in the country. A lot of people were, were, were shocked by that. A lot of people were surprised and was like, oh my goodness, why, how, are, is he joking? Like, you, you got to be kidding me. I think a lot of people forget he said the exact same thing last year. Said the exact same thing almost word for word last year. You just be, become numb to it, guys. It's Vanderbilt. But I was saying, you know, it'd be funny because he believes it. It would be really funny if somebody voted him and it came out, and it's just like, yeah, you know, Vanderbilt thinks they're going to be great. I voted for him. I did not vote for Vanderbilt, but I told so many people that I thought it would be funny that after the media poll was released and it was shown that somebody gave Vanderbilt a first place vote, got a few texts, you know, uh, got a little worried that the SEC was going to be like, okay, guys, you got to be kidding me, right? And people were going to be like, oh my goodness, it's that dude from Locked On Kentucky. Uh, it was not me. I've got the PDF. We could we could show it. I could show it to you on, on, on YouTube right now. I picked Kentucky to win the SEC East. I'm going to give you a few we- reasons why I think it's going to happen. And I want to start it off here with Georgia. One of the main reasons I think Kentucky is going to win the SEC East, a lot of this has to do with the Georgia Bulldogs, obviously. 
So Georgia coming off a national title. I think the big question you have to ask about the Bulldogs is what does their national title hangover look like if there is any? And I think there will potentially be one. Now, let me say this right off the bat. I think that this is a good team. Actually, on paper, I think that this is a great team that Georgia has. On paper, this is a really, really good team that could go out and win another national title this season. But the, the, the lack of returning production, specifically on the defensive side of the ball, gives me a little bit of pause with the Bulldogs. The defense was probably as good as it could possibly get last season. And on paper, it doesn't look like this year's unit is going to be able to replicate those numbers. That's just my opinion. I'm concerned about that linebacking core if I'm a Bulldogs fan. You know, we've got a lot of different four- and five-star guys in there, but there are some guys that have been within that program and just in the college football on the college football scene for quite some time that have not been able to crack rotation, and now they're going to kind of get forced into action in a way. I'm just curious to see what their production looks like after losing so many, so many talented guys in that front seven. Now, they got a couple of guys back. Don't get me wrong. It's just not as much as you would like especially if you've got two or three upstart teams in your division. So again, I think this team on paper is good. A lot of people are going to continue to doubt Stetson Bennett. Offensively, I think Georgia may take a little bit of a step forward this year. They've got a lot of different guys around him that they can work with. The running game might not be as dominant. They don't need a lead back to be dominant. Georgia's proven that. I'm just curious to see what the rotation looks like there. Got a lot of young guys that are going to need to step up. But yeah, offensively, I think this is this is this team is sound. But the hangover, I just I, I don't like all I don't like the returning production. I don't like the returning production, especially with two or three teams in your league that could give you problems. I want to talk about those teams here for a second. So this is something I, that I was asked on Locked On Vols by Eric Kane, host of the show. He said, "Well, you believe that Kentucky's going to potentially beat out Georgia for the East title? Why couldn't it be Tennessee?" Why couldn't it be South Carolina? Why couldn't it even be Florida? What does Kentucky have that those other teams don't? I think right now, the, the first thing that, was, that came out of my mouth on the show was stability. I think that this program has way more stability than Tennessee, South Carolina, or Florida does. And I don't think that there's really a whole lot of arguing with that. You look at Tennessee and South Carolina, they are right now currently about a year and a half into uh, some new coaching tenures, into some new uh, different staffs there. At those respective programs, Florida right now is in the middle of just, I don't even know what's going on down down in Gainesville right now. They are hot and cold. Like every other headline that I'll see during the week, it'll be like, here's why Florida is a dumpster fire. And then the next one will be like, here's why Florida is getting this five-star kid. Like, oh my goodness, what? make up your mind, Florida. Like it's, It's interesting to see what's going down in Gainesville right now. But a lack of stability for those three programs. I also think that from a roster standpoint, you look at the one in the two deeps for these different teams. I think Kentucky is a more well, well-rounded squad. I truly believe that. And then you look specifically at Tennessee and South Carolina from a preparation and from a development, and from a coaching standpoint, I think Kentucky is a more consistent program. You love what Tennessee is doing offensively right now, right? You love Hendon Hooker as a potential dark horse for the Heisman. Focus and having fun, as some people in Auburn, Alabama would say. But, but... The game planning with Tennessee last year, again, to go back to what I was saying about stability and consistency, was not there in the second half. The Volunteers were a really, really good first-half team, consistently not a great second-half squad. Kentucky could lose to Tennessee and Knoxville this year, and we're going to get to the schedule in a second. Kentucky could lose to Tennessee and Knoxville this year and still beat out Georgia or beat Georgia later in the year and make the SEC title game. So I'm not saying like, oh, I'm I'm saying that you could technically lose that game to the Volunteers. I'm saying that that's a possibility. But we're talking about winning the the title here. Talking about winning the title here. Because here's what could happen. Kentucky could lose to Tennessee. Tennessee could lose to Georgia. Kentucky could beat Georgia. They're in Atlanta. If they go 7-1 in conference play, they're one loss to Tennessee. Tennessee then has two losses, Georgia has one loss, and the tiebreaker goes to the Wildcats. So yeah, let's go ahead and and look at the schedule. Okay, this is not the tallest task that Kentucky has ever faced. According to ESPN's FPI, which some days I question and I laugh at and I say, whatever, it is smoking, I want some of it. And then there are some days where it's just like mathematically I understand where it's coming from. Kentucky is number 31 in the country in strength of schedule, according to ESPN's FPI. There are like, what, 130 
uh, FBS teams, 131. So that's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's a solid strength of schedule. That is actually the weakest strength of schedule in the Southeastern Conference. That is the 14th best strength of schedule in the SEC, dead last. The next closest SEC team in strength of schedule is Georgia, actually, at number 23. So Kentucky's number 31st nationally. Georgia's number 23 nationally. Both of them are the two worst strength of schedules in the, con- in, in the conference. You look at Kentucky's schedule, and I've got it right here in front of me. We talked about this. I was on, goodness, I can't remember the name of the podcast, the No Huddle, Huddle podcast, just a couple of weeks ago. We were breaking down Kentucky's schedule. You play Miami of Ohio week one, okay? Kind of get things uh, get things going, figure out what's going on with the receiver room, right? Week two, you're at Florida. Historically, has been a really, really tough uh, out for the Wildcats. It's going to be a tough out this year. I've said it over and over and over on this show. What does Florida look like after playing Utah? That is a huge question mark. Regardless, if, if they look like world beaters, I still like Kentucky's chances. Because, we again, we talk about depth. We talk about the talent in the two deep. I like Kentucky's consistency there over the Gators. Youngstown State, Northern Illinois could potentially be 4-0 heading out of September. You've got a, a road game against Ole Miss that on paper looks difficult. I'm starting to question the Rebels as we get closer and closer to the season. I don't think that game is as difficult as some people may be projecting it to be. South Carolina at home, upstart team. You get them at home. I think you like your chances in that one. Mississippi State, uh, that's a team that gave you fits last year. Again, it's in Lexington. You've got time to readjust. You've got time to retool. You like what you're doing on the offensive side of the ball. If you don't turn the ball over as much, you really like your chances in that game. At Tennessee, like I said, could be a loss. October 29th. At Missouri, that's a game I feel like Kentucky should win. Vanderbilt at home, a game that I think Kentucky should win. And then the big one, the most important game, it's already, it's sold out in like, what, five hours, if I'm not mistaken? The ticket sold out in five hours. At home against Georgia, November 19th, before you go, go and play Louisville at home to round out the season in the Governor's Cup. That is a huge matchup with the Bulldogs, and thank goodness you get it at home. To, just so, to, to recap everything, why I think Kentucky's going to win the East, Georgia potentially has a hangover. I don't like their, their uh, returning production. Uh, specifically on the defensive side of the ball. I think that Kentucky, from a consistency and a stability standpoint, is better than the upstart teams in the SEC East. Schedule-wise, they've got the easiest schedule in the SEC, according to ESPN FPI. They bring back a quarterback. They bring back a ton of depth themselves at key positions. And they get the one team that can truly challenge them for the division and still might may end up taking it. May end up taking it easily. We don't know. But they get that team at home. That game, said this on ESPN 106.7 at SEC Media Days, was talking to Jacob Goins, friend of the program, and I said, do you remember the 2013 Texas A&M-Missouri game? Johnny Manziel comes into Columbia, Missouri, and he falls, and Missouri advances to the SEC title game. It was a very exciting moment. Obviously, Texas A&M, that Texas A&M team and this Georgia team, I think, are, are stark. There's a stark def- uh, difference there. But that it, this game, I know that it's several months out. It gives me Texas A&M, Missouri 2013 vibes. I think this is a game that, that Kentucky can go in there and win. Uh, I, I think that Georgia has the opportunity to win the SEC East and has the, the team to do it. Has the staff to do it. Goodness gracious. Man, talk about people that know what they're doing. Kirby Smart at SEC Media Days was phenomenal. But if there's ever going to be a year where the Wildcats pull this off, I think it could be this season. And so I'm picking them. There's no shame in picking them. It's a, it's a preseason poll. Why not? And we'll get into record predictions later on down the road. I mean, again, we're like a month out. We're getting so close to making some official predictions, locking some things in. Probably going to do a lot of different over-under stuff. I love doing that. It's going to be a lot of fun. So make sure you're subscribed to the podcast either on YouTube or if you're listening on Spotify, Apple, Google, Google Podcast. Go ahead and hit that that uh, that subscribe button. That's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On UK. You can follow me on Twitter at Lance Stahl underscore, and you can follow the show on Instagram at Kentucky Podcast. I will see you all tomorrow for another episode of Locked On Kentucky. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and God bless.